Uh, good afternoon, and uh, with my background teaching in high schools for 20 years, I'm conscious that you guys just need a bit of a lift. So uh, I'm going to introduce you to the realm of, uh, of fantasy and, uh, and a whole range of uh, factors around research that might be a bit different. Um, so, yes, as David says, I'm, I, my background is in uh, currently working in the uh, University Department of Rural Health in uh, uh, Warrnambool. It's a kind of a, a mixture of... Um, uh, Deakin, <coughs> Deakin University and Flinders University uh, and our role, our business there is uh, basically about promoting uh, health uh, professionals in the region and health research. But what I'm going to talk about today is a bit of, bit of research that I've done before this uh, and uh, hopefully we're going to bed some of this down uh, in the region uh, if I get enough time to do that. So let's move on, shall we? The, these dot points sort of come through. So uh, problem gambling is the issue, uh, and it sort of sounds a bit trivial compared to all the, the issues you've been talking about, uh, colorectal cancer, all kinds of serious diseases that need major intervention. Uh, but gambling is an um, amazing phenomenon. I was only introduced to it about seven or eight years ago. The background was in chronic disease research, and I kind of got co-opted into running a mental health unit and running this research around gambling. And at those days, I didn't know much about it. And it, it took me a while to pick up the threads. But there is an emerging problem about, around gambling in our community. <clears throat> and more and more, it, it used to be poker machines, now it's online gambling, all kinds of different formats. Thanks. And in that context, what we tried to do was to say, OK, th there's a problem, we need to develop uh, a treatment that can address the addiction, because basically under DSM-4 and DSM-5, this is a comorbid mental health addiction. So we're trying to develop dismantling studies to find all the components, a little bit like Steve, but not quite as large as Steve's components. These are sort of the, all of the components of a treatment that actually make a difference to the, to the person who's addicted. And what actually set me to write this, and actually I've written a paper about, uh, around this, uh, and the, the presentation is a bit of a summary of the paper, but we had the European uh, Conference on Gambling and Treatment in Helsinki last year. Uh, it's a big affair. It happens every second year or so in Europe, and everyone gets together to talk about how to promote the industry and make money out of gambling, while at the same time how to treat all those people that are affected by it. So it's an interesting kind of dialogue. So at the conference in Helsinki, uh, we, we started to get a, an emerging message that don't worry too much about treatment in this area. Um, there's a whole lot of treatments out there. They all have an impact. Let's just go with it and not worry too much about the detail. And I thought, oh, this is not good. This is going sort of flying in the face of the sort of things that we've been trying to do. So that's the context. So the European conference in Helsinki, raising those interesting points about treatment. Thanks. There are many successful treatments, and we know in the field, this is psychotherapy treatment. This is not drug treatment, although we do use naltrexone as, a, as an interim treatment for people who are too affected by their problem to be able to uh, take on a normal kind of psychotherapeutic treatment. So there are lots of treatments out there. They range from cognitive behaviour therapy, pure behaviour therapy, musical therapy, chocolate therapy. There's a whole lot of therapies that help to get people better. Uh, and they do, you know, people get better and people recover naturally. So at the same time, though, the gambling industry is growing out of all proportion. Uh, everywhere you go, it seems that uh, I was in Vegas recently and it seems there that whole concept is kind of s spreading out across all through the states because uh, the states in, the, in America are thinking that they can overcome their economic difficulties by building casinos and attracting money from overseas, uh, you know, attracting people from overseas and making money from them. Downside is that a lot of the people that suffer as a result of the gambling industry are the local people, not the, not the high flyers that bring in the millions. Yeah, and the other message, I guess, is uh, which was toning down the whole agenda that I, I was introduced to some years ago about the whole problem gambling is that uh, the industry needs to be held to account and some sort of mechanism, a little bit like you are talking about earlier in, in the other uh, preventive health strategies, some mechanisms for early intervention and management so that this industry just doesn't run rampant 
through the system and then develop all of these diseases which you could, or problems which you could associate with the diseases that we saw diabetes is associated with no exercise or poor diet. There's a whole lot of preventable crises that are coming out of this stuff. So, but, the, but the conference was telling us, let's not worry too much about it now. The industry is doing pretty well uh, and it seems like there's not too many problems out there. So let's just get on making money and uh, if there are a few problems, we'll deal with them as they come. So that's the kind of context in which this is set. Thanks. This dodo bird conjecture, I was only introduced... Uh, who, who's ever heard of it? Who's got a psychotherapeutic background or a psychology background? No one? So no one's heard of this dodo bird conjecture. And I hadn't either until a few years ago. And, and, it, and it's basically the idea uh, that all... It comes from that um, Alice in Wonderland story where the dodo bird says, run around the lake and dry yourself off, fellows, because you're all wet, and let's have a competition. So they all race around the lake and have the competition. They got back and they said to the dodo bird, well, who won? And he said, oh, it doesn't matter. You've all won. You're all going to have prizes. So that's the context of this uh, all treatments kind of work. Let's throw science out a bit, throw it out the window and say, look, let's not worry about the real things that are causing improvements here. I mean, if you try to do that in cancer treatment or diabetes treatment, the world would laugh at you. But in this context, they're saying... No, no, all treatments work. Let's progress with that. Thanks. So, uh, we've, as I said, we've done a lot of work on dismantling and that's, that, that's our research that I wanted to try and describe. The question is, in all of these things that we've been doing, cognitive behavioural therapy based mainly, uh, which bits have the most effect? And in the current environment where our funding for this intervention has gone from significant funding eight, nine years ago to no indexation and possibly reduced funding now, uh, we need to know what works best and ef efficiently so we can use it rather than kind of muck around with treatments that might get a little bit of an effect and not have the, the kind of outcome we want. No. So, but in spite of our efforts, this dodo keeps rearing its ugly head uh, and we have to deal with it. So what we're trying to do is deal with that creature it's a pretty unlikely looking critter, isn't it? Um, and a big, fat, flightless bird. It didn't survive. Uh, next one. And these guys didn't either. These are the moa from New Zealand. Next one. He's about four metres high. These are real, these guys. Uh, and they didn't survive either. They're big, meaty, tasty, flightless birds. Uh, so I'm thinking the dodo is in the same category as that. So for us to accept that, that theory, and it's, it's, it's put out there seriously by quite a few writers and clinicians in the field, uh, needs to be challenged, so that's what we're doing, basically. I just thought it might be a novel way of introducing a bit of what we do. Okay. So Tim Flannery, if everyone's read any of his, book, any of his books, did write about the mower. They were uh, a major food source in, uh, in New Zealand that were wiped out as the as the people became a bit more aggressive in their hunting techniques. So, yeah, not surviving. Thanks. Now, the, to the diagnosis, this is the old DSM-4 for people who are interested in mental health diagnoses. The problem, this is the problem gambling or the pathological gambling diagnosis as it was under DSM-4, thanks. Um, so it's, it, it, they break it into pathological and sort of subclinical which is problem gambling. And both of those categories from the population research we've done, talk about, that's talking about 3% of the Australian population. So it's almost like diabetes, but not quite. But about 3% of the population are seriously affected or at risk of being. Thanks. So that's, that's from the original guidelines. But now, of course, we've now got the DSM-5, which is the next slide. Uh, well, this is the summary of the com components of DSM-4, sorry. Next one. So those ten questions, if you tick any five of those under the DSM-4, then that puts you in an at-risk category and your behaviour is, prob you know, is problematic in relation to your gambling activity. Number, number eight, the uh, committing illegal acts uh, to finance gambling used to be uh, taken as an assessment in that criteria, but with the DSM-5, which is the next one... Um, that, that question is dropped out, so we, there, there is only now nine questions, 
And in order to tick the box for problematic gambling, you need four of those nine. So anyone who's done a bit of this kind of screening in, the, in other areas means that this is, would know that this probably means there'll be more false positive diagnoses. But clinicians say that's not a problem. If someone comes to me with a false diagnosis, I'll work it through and, and find out as, as eventually that they don't need the treatment that we're offering. The argument is that this new screening mechanism will help identify better the people with the problems. Thanks. So in that context, uh, this guy, Wampold, who's written in most recently in 2009, who seriously promotes this uh, dodo bird thesis or conjecture, talks about two different components of treatment. Um, and one of those is the, the contextual uh, component and the other one is the medical component. So the medical, component, medical approach to this kind of study says there are some key things in a treatment that work. It's like a drug or some sort of other intervention. If we take those out systematically, we can isolate which ones work best and so on. The contextual model talks about a whole lot of things that surround a treatment that have an effect, and some people say 80% of the clinical effect of psychotherapy is the context. And there's a list on the next one, I think, if, uh, as we go through. Keep, yeah, we'll keep going. So this is the context. Uh, an emotionally charged and confiding relationship, so people feel comfortable when they're, when they're talking about their problem, irrespective of what treatment you're offering. So all of these contexts sort of are, it is argued that this is what's driving the change. And we haven't been able to set up a randomised trial yet to do it, but it would be a nice thing to do. Have randomised people to a purely social intervention and in another group that get the, the so-called therapeutic impact. According to these guys uh, and this, this contextual theory, that would be that would be getting the effect and uh, the, the treatment effect more than the actual clinical impact. So that's the context of that treatment uh, model. Okay. But but for us, we're thinking, okay, in science, you don't accept a black box treatment. You don't accept that you do a whole lot of things inside some sort of mysterious box and something pops out the other end. You want to know what is doing the fixing, what, what's actually having the treatment effect. So, thanks. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> and, and also, I think in, in, the, in this context, there's the, the argument is there's a fair bit of, as well as the black box effect and the contextual effect, uh, there's an argument there's a fair bit of Hawthorne effect in some of this treatment that we offer. So, uh, we're finishing, are we? Yeah. Uh, so, the Hawthorne effect, as you know, it's, it's just an effect of being in a trial. So in a, as well as all these other things that, that are supposed to be impacting, then this Hawthorne effect is also running. So I guess we better move to some of the data. This is the context, just quickly through the context in Australia, just summarising the situation that we're talking about in terms of the number of people that may be accessing or need some sort of treatment. Nearly 400,000 Australians, all sorts of emerging problems in other areas in terms of gambling. Okay, thanks. Uh, and major differences in some of the re rural areas, we've found that per capita losses in rural areas are higher than their own in city areas. Rural communities can least afford to lose that money. In the cities, uh, it's a different sort of deal. This is uh, some information from the, the initial uh, joint select committee that we've been involved in, looking at some of the things that uh, need to be explored. But essentially, there on page 87, there's a lack of good evidence about what treatments work. So that's the field we're in. Thanks. We we'll keep moving through. From our research, about 85% of the clients we see have electronic gaming machine problems. So they, they're people that are, are hooked onto those automaton sort of electronic uh, gaming machines in hotels. 2% of people are problem gamblers. But the thing is, they affect a lot of other people. So the, the impact is kind of expanding. So for every one person who's got a serious problem like this, uh, there could be up to 10 other people affected. Thanks. Uh, as I said, the uh, EGMs are the most addictive form of gambling. Yep, we can move through these quickly. I just want to get to the data if we can. It would be interesting to talk about the operant conditioning. I've probably haven't got time. This is just a, a bit of a snapshot from the most recent Victorian data on 
uh, suicide related to gambling, an extensive kind of extraction study to show just how many people, I think it was 200 odd people in Victoria committed suicide in the last 10 years because of gambling related issues. Next one, thanks. And a similar m a map from the ones we've seen. Uh, this, uh, this shows the, the distribution of per capita losses in some of these regions. Some of them where we are out on the west don't actually have gambling machines uh, as a policy. But uh, as, as you can see, there's a fair substantial loss of money per capita in most of those regions across Victoria. So, so what can we do about all of this? This is the treatment thing. Uh, and the treatment, as I said, that we are offering or have been offering for the last 10 years or so is cognitive, thanks, cognitive behaviour um, uh, therapy. There's a whole lot of other options I mentioned at the beginning that may uh, affect which treatment that you do use. And as I said, musical therapy, rela relaxation therapy, and there is natural recovery. And on the other s slide, a whole lot of emerging treatments that uh, people are claiming are having an effect in this area. Keeping in mind, one camp in this in this debate is saying it doesn't really matter what you do as long as you have a meaningful relationship with your client you can fix them so there we are and of course the evolutionary idea that uh, we are all gamblers in a way and uh, that's what we that's what we need to live with so that's that's the context so if we can skip through these i'll just get to a bit of data at the end and finish off that's the business model that we've been running basically an eight to twelve session treatment program uh, um, and recruiting clients through the, 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 the service, treating them for that uh, period of time, once a week sessions, and following them over three years in their, uh, after discharge to see what's happening to their gambling activities post that. Thanks. That's just a bit more information about the, the kind of treatment we're running. There's a whole lot of different um, um, uh, forms of treatment being offered. And we have all of the ethics protocols in place to do this, so we are able to track not only the treat during the treatment intervention, but in the post-treatment uh, for up to three years. Some studies that we've done, the main one there that uh, I've got some data to show you briefly, is the three-year randomised control trial, which basically separated cognitive therapy from behavioural therapy to try and work out which components do what. Uh, we've also done uh, a number of other longitudinal studies and we are working at the moment on a uh, uh, NHMRC partnership grant to do a, a proper look at four components of treatment, uh, which is going to look at cognitive behavioural, a combined CBT, and a treatment as usual, which is what people would get if they went to a, a, a normal counselling service. These are some of the uh, papers that we've managed to get out on the longitudinal outcomes. We'll just skip through these, I think, and go to the... Go to the. Um, oh, that's, that's a slide about the rural sector uh, and how we tried to uh, introduce treatment in rural communities. It was successful while we had lots of money, but as our money ran out, of course, uh, the communities that suffered most were rural, and we withdrew our services from those communities because we could get KPI outcomes easier in the city. So once again, rural communities uh, are fine when there's plenty of money around, and uh, we're able to make the special effort to get out there with the treatment. But uh, things are looking a bit grim at the moment. Thanks. And we did we did find that we we get similar treatment outcomes for people in rural communities uh, as we did in the in the metro areas. So the treatment kind of effect seems to work. Some a brief snapshot of research outcomes. This is a, an interesting slide with our uh, cognitive. And, uh, I haven't got that little thing. Uh, we've got cognitive therapy divided against behavioural. Uh, and the top, the top two are the, the people that... Act, mm, here we go. Could you bring me back, please? Can, can you come back to the previous one? Uh, yep, almost there. Beautiful. I'll keep my finger off that button. Uh, th these are the people that actually completed the treatment. This is a cognitive. Uh, this is block randomization into the two equal groups, cognitive therapy and behavioral therapy. You can see that the people that completed the behavioral therapy seem to drive down the main outcome measure, which is the Victorian gambling screen measure. 
significantly and to stay down. People in cognitive behavioural treatment kind of drove... It was, it, you got the effect early, but people tended to lapse back into uh, risky behaviour. And the dropout rates are similar in both groups. So w from that, what we want to try and work out is um, how to tailor the treatment to prevent the dropout uh, and get those sorts of effects. There's no significant difference between the actual effects, the treatment outcomes for the two groups when you look at the, the, the proper analysis. Thanks. It's a bit more of a snapshot of uh, uh, ongoing outcomes over time. This is just evidence that when you provide treatment, uh, you can get huge effects. And this, this slide just talks, this shows a co cohort study of people that stayed in treatment, the blue, compared to people that didn't, the red. So we can get these effects and just keep skipping through. This is just, and then longitudinal tracking shows the same kinds of outcomes over time for people that stay in treatment. Thanks. But what we need, just quickly finishing off, is, is to continue our, ran, our uh, uh, dismantling studies and to identify more components that actually work rather than just accepting the dodo bird sort of hypothesis that, that uh, I've presented. Thanks. Keep going. So in all of that, I guess if we want science to uh, prevail, then the kind of dismantling work that we're doing, I guess we need to do more of, and that dodo uh, needs to disappear. But it's uh, still pretty much alive and well in some sections. So thank you very much. Sorry I've run out of time.